now the anointing of the moment. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you. Praise the Lord. Amen. I am very excited to be in your presence this day. I am honored to have this opportunity to speak. And uh, those things Mama Nyambura said are true. I, I thank God for our friendship. I was thinking the other day, I'm sure you remember 20 years ago. It's 20 years ago when we left this church and went to North America. And I was thinking, I'm sure Mama Nyambura remembers a very stressed mother of three little kids getting on a flight uh, to go and join my, uh, my husband and the children's dad. And it was a very stressful night, I still remember it. And I look back on all those days, it was on the 18th of September, 1994. And I look back humbly at all the things that God has done for my family uh, from that night that we left. I have come back several times. I was here last year sometime. I didn't speak last year, but I enjoy coming back here and I enjoy this fellowship, uh, this church. As Mama Nyambura said, it's, uh, it's my home church when I'm here. Uh, we are going to share from the book of Acts chapter 27. So you can make your way to Acts chapter 27. Uh, we'll be sharing from here, from there. And I'll give you the background a little bit of this story before we start reading from verse 9. The background is Paul. This is the Paul, the life of Paul. We all know, we, when you read the New Testament, you are reading a lot of what, what Paul wrote. So he's no stranger to many of us. And Paul, uh, in chapter 26 of Acts, Paul was brought before authorities because they were not happy that the people, the Jews, his fellow Jews, were not happy that he was preaching the gospel and he was brought before the authorities. And in chapter 26, when you go back home, you can read the story of everything that transpired. And because Paul was a Roman citizen, when he was brought before the authorities, he, the people who brought him wanted him dead, by the way. They wanted him dead. But so when he was brought before the authorities, he decided to appeal to Caesar, to the higher authorities. And the last verse of chapter 26 says, it is King Agrippa who was speaking, this man would have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So what happened after that is that an arrangement was made for Paul, and he was a prisoner, by the way, I'll be mentioning that later. Arrangements was made for Paul and a number of people uh, that were going to be in a ship together to travel from the place they were in at the trial to go to Rome. I'll be mentioning Rome a lot because I'll be mentioning Rome as a place where Paul, even though he's going to go there as a prisoner this time in the, sto in the story that we're going to read, it's also a place he had always wanted to go. If you read the book of Romans, when he wrote to the Romans, in Romans 1.13, he's telling them how he had always, he has, I have always wanted to come to Rome. So remember that. Rome is a place that Paul had always wanted to go to. And I'll be asking you to think of a place, of a situation, of a thing that you've always wanted to do, a place you've always wanted to be, something you've always prayed for. That kind of will be the backdrop of the message and what I want you to be thinking about. So they started the journey in chapter 27. The journey was by sea. And the ship that was to take Paul had 276 men. That's an important number. How many? 276. That will be in verse 27 when we get to it. And the majority of the people of these 276 men were prisoners. And Paul himself was a prisoner. He was among the many prisoners that were going to be in this ship. And I have already mentioned that even though he had, always, he had always wanted to go to Rome, unfortunately he was going to go there as a prisoner, but we are going to see that that didn't defray him at all. So I would like us to read, and maybe I would ask somebody who has a mic, does somebody have a mic and would like to read from me, from the screen, if you put the verses on the screen, from verse 9, because what happens uh, from uh, when they started the journey, uh, when you read from verse 3 to 8 of Acts 27, you will notice that there were a lot of troubles. They've already started the journey, but a lot of stuff, troubles started happening along the way. The winds were against them, they were delayed, and because they lived in a place that the weather 
is very important. If you want to travel, travel in, those, in those places, if you wanted to travel by sea, you have to travel at the right time. You can't just wake up in the day and decide that you're going to travel. Uh, so they had been, um, there was a lot of delay. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of things that are happening. And the title of my message, if you're looking for a title to write down, will be Delayed, Stormed, and Detoured. Thank you for putting it on the screen. Delayed, stormed, and detoured. That's what we're going to be thinking about. And I'll be asking you to think about your life because anything that I can stand here and say or anybody can stand here and say, it, does, it, it can be good, it can be neutral. The only thing that's important is that which you take and apply to your own life. So think along with me. Don't just listen. Think along with me. Think about your life and the things that I'll be mentioning, how do they apply to your life and how can you get them so that God can encourage you through them. Anybody willing to read for me those verses on the screen? Yes, sir. Okay, with the mic, yes, kindly. And this is from verse 9. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the first. So Paul warned them. Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and, br and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was un unsuitable to winter, to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in, in Crete facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the no Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the, to the lee of a small island called uh, uh, Kauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together, fearing that they would, they would run aground on the sandbars of the, the sites. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a, a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from the crater. Then you would have spared uh, yourselves with, with this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will, lo will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the Lord, who's, uh, an angel of the God whose I am and who I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. On the 14th night, uh, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when about midnight the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took uh, soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep a short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. 
in an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with, with, with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that uh, held the lifeboat and let it fall away. Just before dawn, Paul asked them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the, rad the, the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to the land. The rest were to get there on planks or on pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached the land in safety. Praise the Lord. I will go. <clears throat> Thank you. It is good to read the word of God. The Bible says, blessed is he who reads. So have you been reading along? So you've already been blessed for reading. Born as if were. It is good to read the word of God. But we are going to be talking about that story. And of course, as you notice with that story, unless you have been involved in sailing, in being in the sea and sailing, the language gets a little technical. You get to the radar and the thing, you wonder what those things are. But the point is, they are coming from one point in Caesarea, and they want to go to Rome, and things happened along the way. Now, we started off by, the, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is the fact where this, the journey was delayed. They were supposed to leave at a certain time, but the journey was delayed. They were delayed because there was the wind, it was difficult to travel. And I want us to be thinking, have there been a time when you have started to do something and something happened along the way so that you are delayed or derailed, whatever the terminology you may want to use? Think along with me and with the, this story about all the things that happened and hopefully uh, at the end we are going to, God is going to bless us, not the end, as we go along. But there was so much trouble at the beginning that they were delayed and that's the, the delayed part of the, the, the title of the sermon. What happened when they were delayed? What did Paul do? He gave them a warning. I want you to come along with me. Paul gave them a warning, right? And he told them, please guys, and this time, you know, sometimes when we talk, we say guys all the time when we mean, when even when you're talking to, sometimes you see a, some girls talking to some girls and they say, hey guys, let's do this. This time it was all guys. Okay. So he tells them, guys, let's not go. This is going to be dangerous for us. It's going to be dangerous for the ship. It's going to be dangerous for the cargo. Let's not go. This is not the time to do it. But you know what the people, the, 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 the sailors and the captain of the ship, they, look, they probably looked at Paul and thought, by the way, have you looked at yourself? You're a prisoner, okay? You know, you're a prisoner. We are the people who are running the ship and we know what happens. We are sailors by profession. What are you talking about? Basically, that's what they told Paul. And they ignored his warning. And I know that, this, that that's quite familiar. That's the first thing I wanted us to think about. The idea that somebody gives a warning and this was a godly warning as we are going to see. Sometimes we get given all sorts of warnings. We can't follow 
all sorts of warnings that we are given. But this is a godly warning that Paul is giving to these sailors. Let's not travel at this time. It's not going to be safe. It's not going to be good for us. They ignored him. Have you ever been given a warning that you ignored? And I know we, I don't want a show of hands because we could, might all you know, be thinking about times when we're given a warning that we ignored. And sometimes the warnings are little, you know? Like if somebody tells you maybe there's a banana peel somewhere on the way, and if somebody tells you if you keep walking by that banana peel, one of these moments you're going to slide and you're going to go down. That could be a warning. And they ignore you and they keep walking around the banana peel, and then next thing you know, boom, they're down because they stepped on the banana peel. Some warnings are small and are of not much consequence, but I'm sure there are some of us here who've been given some severe warnings somewhere along in our lives. And we have people, maybe it's our parents who gave us a warning. If you keep walking with that company, something is going to happen. If you keep doing this, something is going to happen. Maybe it's a doctor who gave you a warning. If you don't change your diet, and again, don't raise any hands if you have been given this warning, but if you don't change your diet, the path you're walking on is not good. Maybe it's a teacher who gave a warning. And sometimes, you know, those warnings get ignored. And what happens is that if godly warning gets ignored, and I'm careful to put godly warning there, because, you know, you've also been given that types of warnings that may have come from other places. But there are, go there are consequences when we ignore godly warnings. But I don't want to leave any one of us who may have ignored a warning hanging there, like I was given a warning and I didn't do anything about it and there are going to be consequences. And maybe there were consequences. But the encouragement I want to give you is that when you look at the story we've just read, God gave these people a second chance. So I want you to think of God. Whatever warning you may have been given and you ignored, God is here to give you a second chance. Praise the Lord. Second chance. That's what God is here to give. So if you, have, if you fall in that category, be encouraged. But my, the other thing I want to ask to think about very quickly is, what happened to Paul when he gave this warning? What happened? What did he do thereafter? And maybe before we go to Paul, let's think about ourselves. Sometimes we are the people giving the warning. You know, you are the parent giving the warning, you are the teacher giving the warning, you are the friend giving the warning. What do we normally do when we give a warning? Sometimes, especially if it is ignored, we have this attitude of, okay, we're ignored too. You will go around, you will see whatever I've told you will happen, because that's what happened to these people, exactly what told Paul told them happened. Usually we sit back and say, okay, you utani kuta hapa too. And we sit back and when they kuta you back there, you tell them, I told you so, you know. And Paul did tell them that, I, I told you, you should have listened to my warning. But the spirit in which Paul was telling them was different. It was not that judgment of, okay, if you ignore me, you're going, to, you're going to go around and eventually you're going to believe my word. But what Paul did, and this is the encouragement that I want to give those of us who have been involved in giving either warnings or advice, is that Paul went down to pray. As soon as he gave them this warning and it was ignored, he didn't sit there thinking, okay, when you get that, when you hit the ground, you'll come back to me crying or something like that, like we normally get tempted to tell people. Paul went down on his knees and he started praying. And how do we know he prayed? When we read those, the verses, the verses that we just read, verse, starting from verse 25, he tells them, you know, he tells them, man, you should have listened to my advice. You should have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I encourage you, because not one of you will be lost, only the ship will be destroyed. That was the consequence of not uh, taking the warning. But he told them, last night, an angel of the Lord, whose I am and whom I serve, told me this and this and this. And for the angel of the Lord to visit Paul, we know that Paul, when he gave this warning, he did not go back there thinking, okay, I've given them the warning, they're not listening to me, it's up to them, I don't care. He went praying for them. And that's the encouragement that I want to give somebody here who may be looking at whether it's your children, whether it's whoever it is that you're trying to give advice, good, give godly warning to, get down praying for them. That's our job. It is not to wait for them at the end, other end so that we can tell you, them I told you so. It is to get down praying for them. One as if you were. So when our warnings are ignored, let's pray for the people and let's keep praying for them. 
Now, the other thing I want us to talk about in this story is that you notice a very important principle that's happening. And that is this in this ship. And it was going somewhere. But as we have read, the, a, a time came when the ship was no longer going where it was supposed to go. But there was a man of God in that ship. And the point I want to make or the principle I want to share is that the destiny of the ship and the, uh, the destiny of the people in the ship was impacted by the presence of Paul in that ship. Praise the Lord. That's something to be excited about. Because for all definitions, Paul was a prisoner. He got in that ship as a prisoner. He tried to give his little warning. Nobody was listening. He's a prisoner. He, if they had labels, whatever they had labels for prisoners, he had it on. You're a prisoner. Everything. If there was a record in the ship, it said he was a prisoner. Paul, the prisoner. Paul liked to call himself the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I don't think on the records it said the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. On the records, the Roman records. It said Paul, the prisoner. And that's what he was. But Paul knew who he was. Because in the verse that we just read, he said, God, whose I am and whom I serve. So when Paul got into that ship, he, he had the shackles. If there were shackles, he had the label. But when he got into that ship, he knew he was getting in there as a child of God. Born as if he were. And today we are all here. And I thank God for all of you. We are all here today. But tomorrow we are going to wake up and everybody is going to the place where you go on Monday morning. And it's going to be different places for all of us. And I want you to think about that place that you're going to be tomorrow morning. Maybe it's the place where you spend all your week. Maybe it's the place where you spend most of your time. And I want you to be thinking as you get there tomorrow morning, to be reminded, because it's not a new thought, it's just being reminded, that the destiny of the people in that place that you spend your time can be changed because of your presence. Born as if you were. And if we walk around with that mindset, a lot of things can happen. Because that's the mindset that Paul had. That the destiny of the people in this ship are going to be impacted because I am in it. And that was not a case of pride. I mean, this ship, so it, you know, it was a case of I'm going to kneel down, I'm going to pray for them, I'm going to intercede for them. The destiny of the people in this ship will be impacted by your presence. You'll be in the office, you'll be in the field, you'll be in the house, you'll be in the marketplace. Some of us will be in all sorts of places. Maybe you work, wherever you work. And, and the encouragement here is to remember that God is able to build differently with that place because you're there. Whether it's a matatu that you are in, whether it's a bus, whether it's an office, a school, wherever it is, the destiny of those the people in, in that place can be impacted by, by your presence. The destiny of these 276 men was impacted because Paul was there and Paul was interceding for them. And you know what? If it wasn't for Paul, these men would probably never have lived to tell the story. But now they did live to tell the story. So whenever you're in that place tomorrow, don't be thinking, I'm just a cleaner, I'm just a janitor, I'm just a what? Whatever you are in that place, and it, whether a high office or a low office, Remember, you're not just there as that person. That's what you do to earn a living. You are there as a child of God. And the destiny of those people can be impacted just because you are there. Born as if he were. So we get into, we continue with the story. And we get into the storm. And we've read about the storm. It was really bad. Like, I don't know whether there's a worse storm recorded in the Bible. The storm was bad. They got to the point where they just let the ship be driven along because they tried everything they knew and, and it, it just wasn't working. Whatever they tried to know, the, the experts who refused their advice, they tried everything they knew about running a ship and they refused. In verse 15, we see they gave in and they let it be driven along. In verse 17, we see the same thing. They just let it be driven along by the wind. And sometimes... We, we are in situations in life where we've tried so hard to fight, we've tried everything we know, and sometimes in an act of desperation, we just let the ship be driven wherever it goes. That's really, they were desperate. And the, the storm was so bad. So I want to make a few statements about this storm. The storm was so bad that they stopped fighting and they let the ship just be drifted along and that, that's desperation. And I'm sure, I know that there are some people who have got times in their lives when it was so bad that you just let things go wherever because you've tried everything you know. The 
storm was so bad that they let they, they removed the lifeboats from where they are supposed to be. If you normally look at a ship that's functioning well, there's the ship, and then on the side of the ship are the lifeboats. And they are supposed to be that when things get bad in the ship, maybe there's a storm, you get into the lifeboats and they drive you away from trouble. But the storm was so bad, like we have read, that they actually removed the lifeboats from where they were supposed to be, and they had to tie ropes around the, the ship so that it can hold together. Again, these things were not easy. For a sailor to take a, a ship and start removing the lifeboats, you know things are really bad. Uh, the storm was so bad that they started throwing cargo out. Cargo, you know cargo is important. When you're in a ship, or in a plane for that matter, and you're, there is cargo somewhere in the, in the back, draw, back in the, whatever they keep the cargo, that stuff is important. Sometimes it's the whole reason the ship was going, it just happens to carry a few people, it was taking the cargo. So when you reach a point when you start throwing the cargo out, this is serious business, you know? And I was thinking about that, uh, the idea of throwing the cargo out, is one of the things that we can be reminded of that is that sometimes when we have challenges and storms and struggles in life, they help us define what's really important. One has few way. Because in this case, they got to the point where the cargo was no longer important, the lifeboats were no longer important, the plans they had were no longer important, uh, the destination they were going to were no longer important. And what God is telling us also in this story that what's really important in this whole scenario are the people. And that's something to remember. That sometimes storms help us to define what's really important. And what's really important at the end of the day, what God treasures at the end of the day, are the people. He, he cares about the cargo. I'm not implying that God doesn't care about the cargo. But the time comes when he's trying to make a point that there are times in your life when you're forced to look at the people in your life and, and treasure them because that's what God treasures above all things. Uh, the storm was so bad that they gave up hope of being saved. The storm was so bad that the sailors decided to get, get away. We read that in an attempt to the sailors in an attempt to escape from the ship because everything was bad. They knew the ship was headed for disaster. They pretended that they were going to do something over there, but what they meant to do was to actually run away and desert ship. And that's a very serious thing because, you know, uh, first of all, God had already given a promise, but if they had done that, if everybody had run away from the ship, then every, the, the prisoners were just going to die. But God says an important, an important thing is said in verse 21. Paul said to the centurion and the, sh the soldiers who are planning to, who are pretending that they're going out there to do something, Kumbe, they wanted to escape. He said to them, uh, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. Bwana Asifiwe. Unless these men stay with the ship, we cannot be saved. And I thought God is trying to remind us something here. Because sometimes God has provided a plan for us. Like in this case, he had provided a plan. He was doing something. But these people were pretending to have a side plan. They were pretending to, have some, to do something. But what they are doing is having a side plan of their own over there. And it's very tempting. It's very tempting when there's a storm in your life to start making this other little plan here. And sometimes we, we shamelessly pretend that we are going to do something else over here, but we know that we're trying to make our own little plan. We know God's plan, but because the storm is so bad and things are so desperate, we are tempted to have our own little ways. And you can think of all sorts of examples where we, we, stay, we get our own little plans. You are a young lady and you have waited for the Lord for a long time. And a time comes and this seems to be a, to be a storm that has been with you for a long time. And you start having seen this a, the guy over here. And when you're met with the brethren, you pretend he's your cousin or you pretend he's your... You know, we do all these things and everybody can think of something that can fit in that category. But the encouragement is for us, stay with the plan. Stay with God's plan. Don't have your own side plans. He has already provided a plan. Stay with the word of God. Don't try to start... Uh, don't start trying to justify something that's not in the word of God. Stay with the fellowship because that's where God has provided 
uh, leadership for us. And thankfully, this is the second time that Paul is giving them a warning. He told them, unless you stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Thankfully, they listened to him this time and they, they cut off. They, they stopped what they were trying to do. Finally, about the storm. It was so bad that these guys had not eaten for 14 days. Now, if everything else we've said about the, 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 the um, storm being bad doesn't convince you that it was bad, this was bad. Because think about it, 276 men, and they have not eaten for not one, not two, not three, 14 days, they had not eaten. I know some of us had go, have gone for a couple of days without having eaten, and I don't know what your experience is. One time when I was, uh, I think I was 22, 23, or something like that, when I was in KU, and I had an issue going on in my life for a long time, and I decided, I was a new Christian too at that time, and I decided I was not exactly new, but I knew what fasting was. I decided to go on a seven-day complete fasting. I was only taking water. It was so bad, I got to a point where I wasn't even taking water, which was bad for me. But I went for the whole seven days, and at the end of it, I was like a walking zombie. I, my, nothing was functioning. When I think about this guy, and I thank God, whatever I was praying about, it didn't happen the following day or the next day, but when I was thinking about it and looking back, God answered the prayer that I was praying uh, to him during that time. So I thank God for that. But these guys had not eaten. And could you think of the reasons that they hadn't eaten for 14 days? Because not eating is not easy. I mean, we eat. That's, we love to eat. The body calls for food. Why would these men not have eaten for 14 days? Maybe because they were just scared. You know, it could be they were just too scared. The storm was that bad. It could be they could not... I imagine, when I imagine the ship and what was happening, because they took such a violent buttering, what I imagine was happening is that maybe they were holding on to a car rope, you know, and you have to hold on tight, and if you're going to have to hold on tight all these days so that you don't get thrown in the water in the wrong place, then what time do you have to go look for the food? Maybe that's the reason they hadn't eaten for 14 days. Maybe they were just... Um, they couldn't find the food where it was. But for 14 days, they had not eaten. And, uh, and Paul said they had been in suspense for 14 days, and that's why they had not eaten. But Paul says something in verse 34. Now, I urge you to take some food. He's talking to these men who are scared and desperate, and they know they are going to die for how bad the storm is. And he's telling them, I urge you to take some food you need it to survive. One as if you were. Can you say with me, you need it to survive? Most of the times, it's very rare unless somebody is very sick. Very sick. It's very rare that any of us need to be urged to eat. I urge you to eat. It doesn't happen unless somebody is very, very sick. Maybe the only time it happens, it's in, in a hospital somewhere. But the important principle that we are getting from here is that when you are in a storm, because remember I talked about being delayed and then being stormed and detoured. We are coming to the detour in a minute. But when you are in a storm, and you will be, we have been, we will be in a storm. Maybe some of us are in a storm. There are some things that you cannot do anything about. And this is not a new idea. We know that when we are in a storm, there are some things we cannot do anything about. These 276 men, there's nothing they could do about the direction of the ship. It was already going its own way. There's nothing they could be do about the winds. They were already coming. There's nothing they could do about the people who are trying to run away. There's, there are so many things they could not do. They could not dictate the direction that the ship was going. But there are some things that they could do. As if he were. And that's what I'm coming to, that when we are in a storm, sometimes there are some things there's nothing we can do about. And the storm could be whatever minute size of a storm. There's not, sometimes there are things there's nothing we can do about, but there are things we can do something about. And that's what I want us to think about today. What are some things you can do about the situation you are in? There are some you can't do anything about. And by the way, for all those that you can't do anything about, the most honorable thing to do is to leave them to God completely. One has to way. But for those there's something we can do about, God is kind of trying to remind us here that I need you to do those things. For, those, for these men, one of the things they could do is lighten the ship. 
they removed the cargo. After they had eaten, they threw away the rest of the, when I was uh, reading the Swahili Bible in this, they, they threw away the gano, you know, the wheat. That it says, well, it's to ile and gano. So for, you know, because they were in the process of trying to lighten the ship. They could lighten the ship. They could hold on maybe to what they were holding on to. Those are some things they could do. And they could eat bonas if you were. And I want you to think about a situation in your life where God is telling you, yes, you're in this situation, and you cannot do this, you cannot do that, and you can't do anything about this, but there is something you can do. You can eat, you know? And the eating is going to be different for all of us. But notice what Paul told them. Eat, you needed to survive. So it, it was, he had already promised them that not a single hair of, of their heads would be lost. But if they were not going to sit down and eat, that was not going to happen. They needed to eat to survive. And there are some things maybe in your life that God is reminding you, don't worry about this because there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do about this. The best thing you can do about it is leave it to me. But you can do something about this over here and you can do something about this and you can eat. Of course, for some of us, maybe they need to be reminded that, you know, like we talked about uh, at the beginning when God, uh, when you get warning from a doctor that you don't, you should not eat certain things. So for some of those people, they probably need to be encouraged. Don't eat those things because you need that to survive. So whatever it is in your life that God may be mentioning to you, don't, you need to do this because I've given you the capacity to do it and you need it to survive. One as if he were. So God, if God, if you've been given a warning, let me just go back to the example of the, a, a doctor giving a warning. If you've been given a warning about some things you should not eat, then it is your business. God is not going to do the not eating for you. You have to go, you're going to have to do it yourself. It's your business to, make, to do that which you have been asked to do. I, I saw a YouTube clip uh, some time back. Somebody, I, I don't know whether somebody was making fun, but there was this lady, and I guess I don't know whether she, she was gaining too much weight or whatever the, the issue was, but here she was praying th for the food, and she decided, and I'm sure some, some other people must have seen it, she decided she was going to bind those calories. In the name of Jesus, I bind these calories in this food. <laughs> If you saw that, and, and, and you know, what she needs to do really was to take the calories that she did not need and put them on the side because she needs to do that to survive. So there are many things. Um, you could try to bind cholesterol if that's the, the one you have issues with in your body, but you are the one. So the, the point here is that there are some things God wants, is reminding you that you cannot do this and you can't do this, but this you can do, please do it. One as if he were. And then uh, as I go on to finish, some, something Paul said something very important to them later on. Well, earlier on when he was praying. He said something to the men after he had told them to, after he told them about the angel of the Lord who had visited them and who had, uh, who had visited him and given. In verse 25, he said, So keep your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Now think about these men, 276 men all crammed up in one space, been fighting for their lives for 14 days, and then Paul is saying something, and he happens to mention one little word, island. Could you say island with me? Island. island. Paul happens to mention one little word, and these men must have grasped onto this word like dear life. Because you've been on the, in the sea for so long, and then finally somebody says, we are coming to some island. Don't worry, you will not die, you know, but we are coming to some island. The word island must have been one of the best things they had heard for the last 14 days. Because what that meant is that they are not going to perish at sea. At that time, many of them were convinced we are going to die in this sea. But the word island, what it meant is that you're not going to perish in this sea. 
This water that is threatening you right now will not be a challenge. And this storm will not last forever. One of these days, you will have an opportunity to stand on dry ground on an island. Do you know how important that would sound for a man who is thinking they're going to die in sea? The mention of the word island meant everything to them. And I wanted us to think about that. Because if you have been in a storm, or when you get on a storm, God is wanting us to remember this promise that no matter how bad things are, when he gives you your pro the promise that you are going to be on some island, then he wants you to grab that and just get a hold of it and use it for encouragement. So whatever you're going on in your, whatever is going on in your life, God is reminding you that one of these days, this thing is not going to last forever. This uh, the storm that's happening is not going to last forever. And one of these days, you're going to be on some island and he's going to allow you an opportunity to stand on some solid ground that you have not been able to stand on before. So you are going to be on some island and the storm that you're dealing with right now is not going to last forever. It's not going to define the rest of your life forever because God is making an opportunity for you to be on that island. But do you notice something that God just said, when he first said this, he just said you're going to be on a certain island. He didn't give it a name. He just said a certain island. And you know, sometimes that's all we need. God giving us a promise. You're going to end up somewhere. Just because God did not name the island initially when he talked about it, he actually never named it. Just because God, using Paul, did not name the island, doesn't mean that the island was not there, doesn't mean that he didn't know the name of the island. He just wanted his, these people to have promise that you're going to be on a certain island and someday you will step on solid ground and this storm will be over. So just because God doesn't give you the name of the island that you're going to be on, uh, that you're hoping that you're going to be on after the storm doesn't mean that the island is not there. It doesn't mean he doesn't know it. So in chapter 28, they finally got on shore after the terrible storm, after they ate, they finally ate because they needed it to survive. And after they got on ground, the first verse on chapter 28, it says, once safely on shore, we found that the island was called Malta. So the island actually had a name. Initially, God didn't give them the name of the island, but now he tells them the name. They find out the name of the island. It is called Malta. And they, one of the, it must have been very exciting to be on this island because they're coming from a storm. But they would stay on this island for a couple of months. Remember, I started to talk about uh, being delayed, being stormed, so we've already been through the storm, and now being detoured. These people started, at least Paul, well, all of them, they started their journey on their way to Rome. And now they find themselves on this island. They must be very excited to be on the island because they are no longer in the storm, they are no longer in the waters, they are no longer in the sea, they are not longer afraid for their lives, they can walk. They must have been very excited. But some of them must have been thinking, Malta was not my destination. Rome was my destination. And maybe there's somebody here who is thinking, remember I told you to think about an aspect of your life, something that you started to do, you've always wanted to do, and then maybe somewhere along the way you got delayed, somewhere along the way you got a storm, and now you've been detoured. Because you meant to go to Rome, but you're now on this island. And even though you, uh, you are happy to be on the island, you're looking around and it can be very miserable to be on an island, no matter the name of the island, when your destination was Rome. And maybe there's, I, 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 as I said, to, I encourage you to think about something in your life. Maybe there, there are things that, as I said, you started off to do, you, you want to do so bad, but somewhere along the way you've been delayed, you've been uh, stormed, and now you've been detoured on this island that you even didn't know the name at the beginning, but now it's called Malta, but you know what? Malta is not Rome, you know? The thing that you wanted to do is not what you're doing now, and it is frustrating. It can be frustrating to be on an island that, whatever the name is. And there are several things that you can start to do when you are on an island on this kind of an island. 
What are some of the things you can do on this island that after a while, the first few days you are excited about it, but then after a while you start thinking, this is not where I was coming, I was going to Rome. And you can start complaining, for example. Complaining comes very easy when we find ourselves on an island that is a detour from where we were going to. Maybe it's a career that you started and you started off wanting to be an engineer or name, name it, what you started off wanting to be. And now you are, several things have happened along the way and now you are stuck on this miserable place called Malta. Maybe you are doing some, some building projects or whatever. You wanted to be an engineer. You wanted to be uh, whatever, whatever you plan to be. Maybe it's a ministry goal that you had, something that you started off with and you wanted to do it so bad. But now you are stuck in this place and nothing seems to be moving in the direction that you wanted. Complaining comes very easy when you're on an island. Complaining comes very easy. And sometimes we veil it and it looks like something else, but it is complaining. When you're on this kind of an island, waiting to go for Rome because that was your destination, the temptation is to start looking at, another thing you can start doing is to start looking at your clock. And every minute you're waiting for the next whatever, the next thing that will take you to Rome. And you can spend the entire time just watching your, looking at your watch, watching the clock, waiting for the time that you'll be able to go to your next destination. You can start dreaming about Rome. You know, Rome is the place you wanted to be. It's the place you started off for. You know, and you've been detoured, you've been delayed, and you now hate this place because it's threatening to be, to take over your life. And you can start just dreaming about Rome, or when I get to Rome, or the things I will do when I get to Rome, when I get to that place that I've always wanted to be. Maybe you can form a club and start, you know, studying Rome. I'm just thinking of all the things we can start to do when we are in an island. Maybe you, you can also get in the business of analyzing these islanders. By the way, those islanders were very good, you know, as you read Acts 28. But down the road, you can get analyzing them. And you might start thinking, these people, I, I don't even like them. You know, they're not ambitious. They are not, they're just sitting here the whole time. You can start analyzing them and criticizing them. Uh, there's so many things you can do when you find yourself on this island, the place where you didn't want to be. You've been detoured into it. Or you can start being angry. It's another very possible reaction that you'll be angry. You'll be angry at the people. You'll be angry at the work you're doing and you'll be just an angry person all the time. You can also be angry at God because you've been stuck in this place and you wanted to go over there. You can be angry with God. You can fold your fists at God. Sometimes when we fold them, we don't fold them out this way. We kind of just stick them out here, but we are angry at God. We can do all those things. And Paul could have done all those things. But Paul realized, just as we talked about the beginning, when he realized that when he was in that ship, he was not just, he was a prisoner by definition of the Romans, but he was a child of God and he was going to do things differently in that ship. When you find yourself in this island, you can do all those things, they'll not help you because they'll just take you down. Or you can realize that this is a detour with a divine purpose. Because that's what Paul realized. That this detour is no ordinary detour. It is a detour with a divine purpose. Can we say detour with a divine purpose? If you find yourself on that island, you have been detoured. This is not where you wanted to be. If you determine in your life that God doesn't waste any detours, he doesn't waste any hearts, he doesn't waste anything. Somebody mentioned earlier on that he doesn't have a, a dustbin. And if he had a dustbin, the only thing he might want to put there is our sins. But the Bible says that he has taken our sins as far as the east is from the west. So he doesn't even need a dustbin. He just throws them away as far as the east is from the west. He doesn't waste, he doesn't have anything for the dustbin. There's no section of your life that God is looking and saying, this one, we have to put it in the dustbin because it's in an island and there's nothing she could do, there's nothing he could do. If you make your mind up that this detour that you are in, this island that you are in is a detour with a divine purpose, you will do like Paul and you will get busy in that island and start looking for something you can do because that's what Paul did. He didn't just sit there and fold his hands and get annoyed that he's not in Rome. He started looking for something he can do. And if you look at Acts 28, you will notice that he got busy. He got busy with the people of Malta. And the, the island of Malta is actually a different place today because of that visit of Paul. 
Unfortunately, it's not what we would wish for it to be, because if you look at the statistics for the island of Malta, it is 90, 98, 90, whatever, 90 something percent Catholic. So that's not exactly what we would wish for it to be. But then we thank God it's not 98% Muslim because at least among those Catholics, the word of God is still mentioned and preached. But Malta was changed as a place because of this visit. And if we look around, if we stop complaining, if we stop being angry, if we stop, start looking at what we can do in that detour that we have found ourselves in, then God is going to use that detour and give it a divine purpose. And in his time, in his time, God will bring you to Rome. God will bring you to that desired destination. Because if you read down chapter 28, you will notice that Paul actually eventually ended up in Rome, the place of his dream, and he did what he wanted to do. Maybe not exactly the way he had dreamed it because he's, he still ended up a prisoner for the two years that the Bible talks about, but he still ended up in Rome. So whatever your Rome is, whatever that place you've always wanted to be, Whatever it is that you got delayed, got detoured, uh, got stormed and detoured, and now you are in this island. In his time, God will bring you to that place. In his time, he will bring you to Rome, and you are going to do what he wanted to do. And I thought, however, when I was thinking about this, there are some of us who might be asked to minister in the island. If God calls you to minister in that island, I hope you would say yes. But going by the story that we have read, let's take encouragement that if we are in that island, if we look for something that we can do for the kingdom, God in his time will bring you to that desired destination. So may the Lord bless you so much. I would like us to stand up. No feet. I would like, as I'll start a chorus and I'll invite um, uh, Pastor Alice to come and finish. But uh, I just want to thank God for this opportunity. The reminders that if you have people in your life that you've been warning and talking to, that what we need to do is to get on our knees and pray for them because that's what God wants. That if you found yourself on an island that God is, you need to look for something to do in that island. That if, uh, if you are in a situation, in a storm, there are so many things you can't do about those, that, that storm. That's true for all of us. But if there's something you can do, then God wants you to do it. Don't sit there and hope somebody else is going to do it. God wants you to do that thing that you can do. I will start a chorus and uh, I've sung, I'm sure it's familiar, and uh, we will pray. You are an awesome God. You are an awesome God. Your name is wonderful. You are an awesome God. You're Oh, oh, oh.